Country. Folks, this episode of the Redneck Country Podcast is brought to you by OutdoorFunctions.com. OutdoorFunctions.com is an online calendar-based system where you can go on, scroll month to month to month so that you ensure you don't miss any kind of outdoor function coming down the pipe. Anything from clinics to banquets to fundraisers to gun club events, whether it's practices or competitions, folks, they're all on there. Head on over to OutdoorFunctions.com and take a look. You can even sort by the type of event you want to look for. At this point in time, they have completely wiped their calendar due to COVID to ensure all the events that are posted there are truly happening. And therefore, folks, they need your help to rebuild it. For free, go on and hit the event submission button on the top right and be able to put your event in there to start to populate this calendar back up post-COVID so that we can all get back out and enjoy the outdoors together. So folks, spread your wings, try some outdoor events, and please be sure to check out www.outdoorfunctions.com. Hey folks, what are the Redneck Country Podcast? You are on with Real Redneck Todd Millard and I got Bill Tom. As usual, Mr. Real Redneck Bill, are you there? Good evening, everybody. What another beautiful day for a podcast. It is a beautiful day for a podcast. I totally agree. And sitting here in the studio, and this week, thank goodness, he's got his own microphone, is the patriarch of Redneck Country, real redneck, my dad, Don Millard. Dad, are you with us? You know I'm with you. I'm right next to you in the studio again. You got me up (laughs) off my nice, comfortable chair in the front porch to drive over here. Yeah, that shows true commitment to the process of Redneck Country Podcast. Appreciate your uh, being here tonight with us, sir. Oh, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Bill. <laughs> he had to make the whole trek a whole two blocks. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> good grief. I made the trek over. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, what's new, Bill? What's going on this week? Well, I had a great week, actually. This was, uh, I'm not going to talk about work because nobody wants to hear about that. But I will tell you about my Saturday. And I think I precursored that a little bit with you with my uh, my pictures and, and stuff I was sending across. Because I get a lot of satisfaction with sending you pictures of, of the, the the grill and what's happening in my <laughs> driveway. You just like rubbing it in. That's oh, what that I is. I tell you. So I, I did. A, I'm not sure if Todd uh, shared that with you, Don, but. Uh, Saturday morning, I had the barbecue started at 7.11 in the morning. And uh, we decided that we were going to do a pork shoulder uh, low and slow on the on the Weber. With my uh, uh, Weber certificate, we, we put that to action. And we've got charcoal on the barbecue and the low and slow pork shoulder. And it turned out absolutely amazing. So... Yeah, we had a good good Saturday with that. Rubbing it in, rubbing it yeah. in. Yeah, we did. Uh, it took nine hours of cooking. Uh, uh, I locked the grill in at uh, two twenty five, uh, uh, and it was between two twenty five and two fifty for the first uh, eight hours. And um, put the the smoke on. I put some apple and some beech for smoke and. Didn't hardly take the lid off it for the first uh, six hours, and by the end of it, you just the bone popped right out, and it was like I was down in Nashville all over again. With the, with <laughs> so the, it was amazing. six hours you put without even looking at it, and this Basically, is charcoal, yeah. right? Yep. So, Dad, yep. you smoked your sausage. How long did you smoke it on charcoal? It was supposed to be two hours. But I left it a little longer because the ones I checked weren't done in my mind. But the ones underneath, yeah, they got overdone. It's a it's a finite thing, and I found myself. I spent a lot of time on Saturday doing it, checking the temperature, backing it off, adding a little bit of charcoal if it started to to come down a little bit in temperature. And yeah, I, yeah, for the first six hours, I think I opened it three times and it was for a split second each time in order to put the wood chips on the, uh, on it to, to add the smoke. And by the time it came off, it had a nice smoke ring on the outside. The crackle uh, it, it was there uh, on the outside edge. It was just, it, you know, what? It, and the meat itself, it cost $7. We got uh, the seven, seven pound bucks. Rolls. Yep. 
Was that like the yep. gas in your vehicle? Because it was roadkill. Come on, be honest. <laughs> yeah, it could have been. I got it from a friend, so it might have been. But <laughs> it uh, it turned out real well, and I highly recommend if you have an opportunity to do some low and slow charcoal barbecue, and you you put your your techniques to to work and and have at it. So, well, the meat I used, I think, cost thousands of dollars because it was goose meat. And when you count your oh, shells yeah. and your gun and your decoys and your trailer <laughs> and your gas, like, it, but anyway, I had psychiatrist for after yeah. we've had to hang out that long together. I, I, I thought out about 12 pounds of, of goose meat, ground it up, put in a little pork and I made goose pepperoni and goose sausages. How's the steel nice. shot on the blades? I, only one pellet. I found only one pellet. Cause when I, I grind it up. Oh, it frozen. must have been all the ones I shot because I typically shoot them in the head. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, I grind. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I cut it in cubes, and I cut it when it's partly frozen, so I can see where shot might be, and I make sure there's no shot. But one shot went through the grinder. Never dip. Never bothered it. And one shot when I made jerky. One that one shot went through the jerky shooter, and I got it in a piece of jerky. And that's all I've encountered. <laughs> and we shoot like BBs. How the heck did you not see this thing? It had thing? to have been a number <laughs> four. It had to have been a kill pellet or something. I don't know. Any of my enemies, I'm sending you some of Dad's pepperettes. I hope you got dental plan. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But no, but these, <laughs> this pepperoni and sausage come out fabulous. Oh, I mean, they are delicious. And I shared a little bit of it, but I've been... I've been eating it myself, and I did a roast of venison this week, and I didn't even tell anybody. I finished that sucker all myself. It was about a four-pound roast, and I injected it with liquid smoke. I injected it with uh, honey-infused balsamic vinegar, and I marinated it for uh, two days in the fridge in a plastic bag in regular uh, balsamic vinegar, and uh, Montreal steak spice and and red wine, and then after it was marinated, I put it in the Instapot for 35 minutes, and oh man, was it good! I'm telling you, I had the last of it yesterday. He didn't share, Todd. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't even know. I didn't even tell him <laughs> how hurtful. Didn't even. <laughs> I didn't even tell. Him. I finished it. Turn his mic off. Kick him out. It was awesome. He makes he makes too much fun of me, so I heck with him. I'm gonna eat this sucker. <laughs> yeah, I would too. I mean it's, what uh, make fun of him? So <laughs> yeah. Well, let me tell you what I had. I took out I so I started this fire with, with hardwood and I made sure that it was a specific type of hardwood that I had in the bottom so I could build the coals. And so I started the fire for about 45 minutes to an hour. And then I rallied up the family and got them all ready for, for dinner. And then I went into the shed and I got out these long utensils that uh, for, for special over the coal cooking. Then I went into my freezer and pulled out some perfectly frozen hot dogs and stuck them on those metal things. And we, uh, we, we cooked them up and we ate them up pretty good. Well, I, I tell you what, Todd, I don't know if anybody could top that there. Cause that was, that was pretty good. I mean, with the hot dogs on the stick. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the wood was hemlock for anybody that wants to know. And those, those hot dogs turned out amazing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, the hemlock was the key. I used that special smoke. But I did Jeez. something real stupid this week too, as well. I, <laughs> what? I got up <laughs> just just this week. Well, I, this we, was, like don't st we could have a whole other podcast series, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. See what I mean? The Redneck uh, Country Podcast is launching a separate series for what stupid I mean? stuff. Don and, does. And now this was <laughs> this was real stupid. He'll tell you I do stupid things every day, but this was the stupidest thing I've done ever. <laughs> no, hey, you had my sister. I'm I just got saying. up. Uh, <laughs> I got up Monday morning and my wife says, what's your plan? I said, I'm going out and I'm going to wash and wax both cars, your car and my truck. And I, I have these aerosol cans. It's called wash and wax. You hose down the vehicle, you spread, you spray on the, the stuff in the can, you swish it around, you let it dry, you wipe it off. The dirt comes off and the wax stays on. And I thought I'm going to do this. 
So I went out and hosed down the vehicles, sprayed them down. And my truck's kind of high. I can't reach the roof. So I went and got the kitchen stool. It folds out two steps. Got the kitchen stool, <laughs> stood on the top rung, two steps. And I wiped one side and I went around to the passenger side. And I'm wiping the, the passenger side. And the wife come out and she's standing there talking to me. I looked down at her and I went to step off. I lifted the right foot. And that's all it took. That stool went straight flying out from underneath me, right down the laneway. It felt like my legs <laughs> shot right out, and I came right down on my left shoulder, turned kind of left, and my left shoulder hit the pavement, and it stopped dead at the pavement, and then I felt the rest of the body go by the shoulder, and I knew instantly that that shoulder was coming out of its socket. Until oh, the no. Rest, yes, until the rest of my body and collarbone hit the pavement and couldn't go any further so i don't know how far out it came and so i stood up and it felt like my i was out of kilter it felt like my arm wasn't in the right place it felt like it was still out and the neighbor heard me to go down he come running over and he says man your shoulder don't look right i put my hand on my shoulder lift my arm <laughs> and i think i put it back in place pretty good so anyway i'm winging the <laughs> arm around and thinking oh man that's gonna hurt tomorrow it's gonna stiffen up well, nothing doing. The neighbor and my wife both told me I better get out to the hospital for x-rays. I don't want to sit at the hospital. Well, they made me go. So I'm at the hospital, x-rays. It's in, it's in the socket, and it's not out of place. Nothing's broken. And they won't send me to therapy if I do the exercises they showed me. So I've been doing the exercises, but man, oh, man, do they hurt, and did it stiffen up. Yesterday, I couldn't even bring my fork to my mouth with my elbow tucked right into my body. Today, I can get it halfway there. <laughs> now we got problems. I mean, <laughs> now so, we got problems. Yeah. I mean, well, with my thing, right I'm hand. Worried <laughs> I'm worried about how, how you're going to swing your shotgun. And I can't. Think that you yeah, shoot night tomorrow night, and I can't, I can't lift it, can't open it. <laughs> It's out for tomorrow night. Let's it's, let's be real. Now that, I'm hoping in another week it'll be all right. But no, I cannot use the left arm anything above the waist. It just won't come up. I showered this morning, and uh, I'm getting and I had to call the wife in to, to comb my hair. I couldn't because I'm left-handed. I can't do anything with my right hand. So I said, "You got to comb uh, my hair." Well, let me tell you. She doesn't know how I comb my hair. So oh, good we'll, we'll just leave it at that. The most important part. The most important yeah. part. Did it hit the vehicles? No. I never did ask that. Did you? No, found, it, did it hit it your went, truck or no. the mums? It was folded up and shot right down the laneway. Never <sighs> touched. Dodged no. a bullet there. But, oh, man, did I go down hard and <laughs> did I go down in a hurry? So dad used to tell me when I was a kid, I remember this, because my grandfather fell off. He was cleaning the Easter off and he fell off the ladder and ended up in the hospital. And what did you tell me at that time? I wish my dad just wouldn't get up there and do that stupid stuff at his age. Call me and I'll come over and get it done. And now here I got to hear from my mother. Your dad's in the hospital because he wiped out on the like good grief. I wasn't in the hospital. I went to the hospital and I wasn't on a ladder. Would you, would you hang a, out outside just milling around? I was on a, I was on a step stool. No loitering. I've seen the now, signs. Now picture this. Hey, Todd, come on over and wash and wax my car. Here's 10 yeah, bucks. Picture that request, Bill. <laughs> yeah. I mean, is that feasible? Hello. I this just is said, Todd here. You did have my yeah. sister. Give me a freaking break. Yeah, come on over. You could have asked the question. Car. I'm not sure he would have done that. that yeah, I'd, I'd, a, a laugh and, I'd, I'd have looked at the forecast so. and said, it's going to rain in a couple of days. You just hang in there. Yeah. <laughs> All our vehicles hey, are going to get washed. when was the last time you washed your truck? It rained about two nights ago. Yeah, I figured as much. The way you wash your guns, I figured you <laughs> clean your guns. There's no way you're spending the time on your truck unless your wife makes you. <laughs> and she don't care. That's my truck. <laughs> I cleaned it out the other day. We were going on a road trip somewhere down. It's Pilsenberg. absolutely spotless inside right now. And the, not inside. I'm talking just the pickup exactly. bed. Exactly. The cans were rolling around. So I picked out five or six cans, threw them on the grass because I'll put them in the recycler when I get oh. home. But I quit moving stuff around in there when I started finding feathers and, and uh, turkey bones and, and all that had rotted in the back of the truck. Okay, that's enough of this. This is his that's truck. It, I'm so leaving it alone. There's so much you can do, Don. There's only so much you can we do. We took uh, my truck somewhere, my family, and we actually we cleaned her out. I don't know where it went, where we went just a couple days ago, but it, the Royal we, yeah, my wife just yelled down the Royal we cleaned it out. The, I was getting stuff together. We had, we were going somewhere we had to pack stuff up and I came out, they had my truck cleaned right out and I've saved all those turkey feathers because I'm going to put them in my hat. 
Well, I'll tell you what, you wait long enough, things will happen. They just, they just happen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's and eventually it's going to get waxed. Dad, hey. your shoulder healed up yet? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bill, I just, I just realized I'm excited that on August 16th, Todd and I are going to join you and your son Hunter in a musky fishing trip with Palm Predator. Oh, I tell you what, when I heard that this was a, an opportunity, I was excited from uh, beaming from ear to ear because this is something I, I've never done. And when I told my son, Hunter, he, he just elated, absolutely beside himself. And so much that I bribed him into keep, keeping his room clean for seven straight days. <laughs> 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 well, Todd told me that he he uh, was going to book this trip for you and and your son and him, and I said, "Well, how many allowed to go?" And he said, "Well, I think there's room for five. And I said, "Well, can I jump on board and share?" And he said, "Sure." So uh, I don't know whether Todd told you, but I invited my son-in-law along because his birthday is the 18th. So I said to, to Rick, "Hey, how would you like a birthday present? Uh, musky fishing with Palm Predator?" He said, "I'd love it." So. So uh, Rick and I are going to join you guys, and I am so pumped. I'm so looking forward to it. So is Rick. He's excited. And I've yeah. been chirping Nick. And anybody listening, Nick Obermach with uh, Pond Predator Fishing Charters. I've been chirping him because I had my my longtime buddy that I used to bass fish all the time, and Kevin Morrow, if you're listening, we'd go get bass thumb together, and we would compare how good a fishing we we did by the end of the time we were done there by how rough our thumbs were from bass thumb. And I just seen he posted on Facebook last week that he went for his first musky charter and held up some some pretty good size. So I sent him to Nick and I said, hey, I don't care what goes down, but I need a picture that makes those look little. Yes. <laughs> so I, whatever if it's the 50 inch club whatever they call it i'm in that's what we yeah. have to do and he, so nick's all pumped he's not a problem <laughs> yeah whatever it takes yeah i'm i'm excited I, it's gonna be a a great time hopefully the weather holds out for us um, i have no idea we're gonna have to talk offline here about uh, what to bring and uh, you know it, just it, snacks my man kind of stuff, right? just snacks ready to rock that's it hey, he's got everything and it's the big boat. I said to him, uh, this is your big boat, right? Because if you've listened to the previous podcast, you know how I feel about big water little boats. And he said, yeah. uh, nope, got five canoes. Five canoes. There you go. Five little canoes. Little motors on the back. Yeah, I'm point, like, point yep, shoot. that ain't happening. So it is the big boat. So it's we're going to be comfy. It's going to be awesome. So that's it. It's all we need to do is just pack our own. Cooler, and, uh, cooler with snacks, my man. Cooler with snacks. With Oh, man, is, is that ever 57, well. 57 and a quarter inches is the record in that lake. And so we're planning on pulling in a 58 er. Yep. I mean, we've got the crew to do it. That's for sure. Heck yeah. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. It's, it's going to yeah, be a great be, day. So yeah, be a good time. Yeah. We can talk more about that uh, at later podcast too, because that, that, Maybe we can get Nick on. Oh, and, uh, Nick's ready to too. rock. Yeah, he's going to come yeah. on, and we'll we'll have one heck of a of a story time when that podcast drops. So after the 16th, for sure, we will have some stories to tell because it will be yeah. fun. Yeah, I hope so. Win, lose, or draw, it's going to be a good time, and uh, I'm looking forward to hanging out with you guys and, and getting down and doing some some real redneck stuff. So yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be wicked. It'll be awesome. Somebody somebody even said something about going maybe going live. For for a podcast yeah if we can figure out the technology and take the time I'm, to do it <laughs> i'm hoping we can't i'm hoping that we're so busy that, that we don't even think about it we just save it all for the next week's uh next week's podcast it's gonna be good and we could we will definitely go live a few times so everybody check out uh, august 16th watch our our facebook page uh, www.facebook.com slash the redneck country because we're definitely going to go live I, I can almost guarantee it and we will have, be having some fun. So, but yeah, it'll yeah. be a blast. So yeah, so, so we yeah, got that coming down the pipe. Else. Something else too. I was uh, driving around the other day and uh, the wheat fields are coming off and oh, yeah. the geese, uh, I sent you pictures yesterday. Mm -hmm. I guess it was yesterday. And the geese are starting to uh, make their way up, uh, I guess, either north or south here and and uh, find their the fields. And, and I was teaching Hunter. Uh, we went, and I did something stupid too, Don. I'm just going to segue into this a little bit too. I did something stupid this weekend. And <laughs> I don't I know. I don't want to get stupid by osmosis. I'm going to have to stop <laughs> like having <laughs> hanging out with you guys. <laughs> yeah. Well, what I did is I took my golf clubs out 
And I haven't taken golf clubs out of the shed for 12 years, but my son thought it would be a good idea. To <laughs> but you lost the fire poker? <laughs> well, it's, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I have no desire, ambition, or time for another hobby, especially if it's chasing a little white ball around a course. <laughs> but uh, I know there's a lot of people out there to do it, and I, I've had my fair share of fun golfing, but I've got other things to do with my time. But um, So last night, Hunter uh, and I went to the driving range. And the best part about that is on our, uh, on the driving range, uh, at the very back of the driving range was, uh, uh eight turkeys. All right. Now, now you got, got some, got some- <laughs> <laughs> all of a sudden I like golf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, that was the most interesting part because when my hunter and I split a large bucket of balls and, you know, he, he was golfing with his grandfather today. So he, sh- he hit most of them, but I uh, watching these turkeys, there was eight turkeys and they were at the back of the field. And all of a sudden they went into the bush and they disappeared. And then they came out, I don't know, a hundred yards um, away and they kept coming. The T blocks, they got within 20 yards of the T blocks with four of us on the landing there, uh, hitting golf balls down the, uh, <laughs> down the driving range. And they could care less. <laughs> Like, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. They, with they know guns, it's, but they're like, yeah, it's all right. We've seen him with a shotgun, man. It's all right. It's, it's <laughs> the almost guy. If he can't hit us with a shotgun or a crossbow, he definitely ain't going to hit us with that stupid little white ball. <laughs> there was no fear for those turkeys being right out in front of me while I was hitting golf balls. I tell you that for sure. <laughs> but so, yeah. So on the way home from that, we had, uh, passes past a field and I actually had to pull off on the side of the road. And I said to Hunter, what do you see? He says, just a field full of geese. And I said, whoa. So it started then right then and there about schooling on decoy setup. And uh, I told him, this is the best opportunity you can have to learn what little families of geese look like and how they're how set up. How they hang her. in that field. You are exactly. not wrong. It's more than just, oh, there's geese in that field. No, That's no, no, right. no, no, no. Yes. Yeah. And I was trying to tell him, and I'm, you, you guys are the absolute experts on this, and I'm looking forward to learning so much about goose hunting from you guys. But from my, my knowledge and what I had, I was able to explain to him like the little pockets they leave, the sentinels, the feeders, the little families, how they're, you know, there's you know, maybe there was 100 geese in the field or maybe maybe a little more, but each each little family represented something else to the story I was able to explain to him. And to me, this is all a culmination of bringing things together. So when you start to set up your decoys, what are you looking for? How do you make it realistic? And, you know, it, it, to me, it was an excellent opportunity to teach my kids something. It's not just a field of geese, right? Yeah, oh, got that right. It's it's every and, and it's specifically where they are in that field, too, when it comes time, because a, a lot of people we could turn this into a goose hunt podcast. I don't know if we want to go there. We want to go where we want to go, but we're going. So, but for, for me and my standpoint, when we hunt, we hit some pretty big fields and that's the number one thing that me and dad argue about in the morning at four in the morning when you're getting into that field, because dad's been the one I'm working all week. Dad's been the one wasting the gas, driving around, finding what fields, getting permission. And then you get in there and it's that field was so big. And he thinks, and I'm using air quotes. He thinks this is the spot where they were. And that is crucial, especially in the early season, because they're, they're in little families. Well, is this where they were or were they, like 200 yards over there. And it just looked like here. Cause this field's so big because that even, even 80 yards out, you're not getting to pull the trigger and you can have all the decoys in the right spot and everything. And you will bring some in, but the majority are going to go where they want to go, where they were going. Yeah. So you want to be in there and setting up. And a lot of people think, Hey, you just go throw the decoys out, start calling. You're going to call geese in if they're in the area. Not going to happen. Hey, you want to be, you might get a couple, and, and think that's successful, but you want to limit out, you want to get into geese, you need to be where they are. And so, and then figure out, okay, now you know how far out to space them and, and everything else. So, yeah, yeah, it's an art, it's a science. I mean, I didn't want to turn this into a goose hunting podcast. It was just, uh, I think we do it. I, I think, think we keep uh, going. Yeah. I mean, this well, is a precursor to what's coming up, right? I mean, yeah. what's next? What's the next season? Well, you got uh, dove and you got goose, but we can, uh, we, I, we love dove hunting, but we love goose hunting and we got so much that we can share. I, I feel just from, yeah. 
just from experience that we can carry on this goose side because we've already started talking about decoy setups. Do you want to keep going? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I've never uh, dove hunting. Maybe we'll save that for, for yeah. uh, sure. next week or something. But from, from goose hunting um, decoy setup, let, let's talk about that a little bit. What, what are you? Okay, so we're going down here. Dad, you're going to have to interrupt me. He's got his own mic and he's just sitting there swinging his feet beside me here. So the <laughs> I, they call me... I don't, I don't accept, I did not name myself, but they call me the decoy whisperer and it's not, I wouldn't say it's in a good light, is it? Uh, No. (laughs) (laughs) Because I get so mad and irritated because I, I, I feel, I know how I need to set these decoys up and I take the time to figure it out. And when I'm doing this, this sounds so whacked out. And, and I've done, we've done goose hunting clinics where we've gone through various goose decoy setups in, in a field. I have done this at, at the gun club, pulled the decoys out of the trailer and laid them out and explained it. And, and I'm pretty sure the people that have done this with me think I'm an absolute wacko because I'm like, okay, you need to, and this for me is key. This is, this to me is what makes us successful is as I'm laying these out. Now it's four in the morning. It is pitch black. And so to set the scene, dad has scouted all week and the, the, to be successful, the number one thing I'll, 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 I'll kind of rewind on you, Bill, if that's okay. But the yeah, number absolutely. one thing to be successful in goose hunting, I know dad backed me up on this 2000% is not decoy set up, not being able to call, not even being able to shoot straight. It is straight up driving around 80% of, deco- of, of goose hunting is driving around, finding where the geese are, finding what field they're in. Because contrary to, and I've talked to so many people, I've even had, had people that say, oh, I got a buddy that's so good at goose calling. He'll go out in that field and sit down and start calling the geese just come in. Not happening. You got to be where the geese are. If they're feeding in that cornfield or that cut wheat field or that harvested bean field, they're going back to that until they feed it out or they get shot out. And they got, they are on a schedule where until it gets really cold, they're there in the morning and then they're there at night in the evening. And it is clockwork. You will know what time they're going. They they're, they're scheduled like they are ready to go. So it's not hard, but what's the hardest part is finding them in what field. And then, okay, now, now you're there, man, 75% you found them. Now the next 10% to get to that 85%, is getting permission. Yeah, that's that's the key. And that's where I struggle around here because this field beside me is an absolute awesome field for about two weeks. You, you know what I mean? It, or, yeah, or oh, absolutely. And, and they'll move on. They yep. move to the next field and then I don't have permission for that. And I'm sitting there watching them fly by thinking that'd be nice if they'd come my way. <laughs> yep. But you're, you're absolutely right. And, and that, that's the thing with hunting on water relative to hunting on, on, on land is on, when, when you hunt geese, ducks, and stuff on water, you don't need the permission if you're hunting on, on a big lake. I mean, obviously, you got to respect the laws and, and, and people. And that goes without saying. Yeah. But it's not like, hey, I'm going to set up on the field next to me. Uh, oh, I don't have permission on the other one. If the if the ducks are landing on the water uh, in a different spot, you pick up a move and you're okay. Yeah. You and, don't and have it really, permission for the wheel beside your you. Your hardest part at that boots. point is just beating the other guys to the spot. That's right. right? That's yeah, absolutely that's, right. That's your, that's your competition. But yeah, yeah. no, it is it is it is getting permitted. And we got the secret weapon. We've talked about this before where it's dad looks like Santa Claus and uh, send him up and he's got the demeanor and everything else that, uh, and, and then it, now that we mostly hunt around our area, I mean, we just, we know a lot of people. So that yeah, that, that that plays right like and dad's hunted forever so he's now what 71 72 Se- seven look at that see i was being a nice guy 72 and uh so he's been in the area for a long time so know a lot of folks and so we do we do get permission but that is 85 percent of waterfowl hunting is spending that money on that gas and driving around and and you're what you're watching so you know there is there's a 500 geese sitting in that gravel pit and you don't want to hunt. I, now, we we got some guys around that it, it bugs me a little bit, but I will say we don't hunt gravel pits. We do not, especially early season. We don't want to hunt them over gravel pits. They're living 
in those gravel pits. Those All those families are hanging out. And when the migratory birds start coming down, they're going to flock up somewhere. That's going to be with those locals that are hanging out. And they're going to go to the gravel pit. So you go and you're like, hey, opening day, we're going to hit that gravel pit. And you fire that up. Guess what? They're gone. Now they're yeah. out of the area. So we know they're in that gravel pit. We just watch the fields around it. So we'll go park and we'll follow them out of the gravel pits or follow them out of the, off the edge of the lake, wherever they're living, follow them to the field. Then you got to get permission, get permission in that field. And then you hammer them. And then, so then the next day they're going to move because they, 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 they know they got shot up in that field, but they go back to where they're living. They go back to that gravel pit, the pond, they go back to the lake. And now you just follow them out again. And now they go to the next field. And so you get permission and you can hammer these guys over and over. It gets a little more difficult each time because they're getting a little wiser to your setup, but that's where you mix up your decoy spreads and everything else. But, but I, that we rewound a little bit from the decoy spreads, but that is key. I believe is we don't like it right. Dad, like weigh yeah. in on this. You, you refuse to hunt gravel pits. For, for years I had a buddy and we'd, we'd go together. We get on the same shift. Todd was too even, even too young to hunt. But uh, one guy would drive, one guy would hang out the window, and the guy that was driving, he just paid attention to them gravel roads, and he flew down those gravel roads, and the, the spotter would say, turn left at the next intersection, and well, then he'd have to climb into the back seat, get on on the other window. Okay, you got to go right at the next one and, until we found the field you were landing in. Now you're doing that yourself. You're trying to pay attention to the road. At least I'm doing it by myself. <laughs> trying to pay attention to the road. Yeah. You're swinging from side to side, looking out windows. They're over you. They're on the other side of you. Now, now he's getting go. older. I've got to start second guessing this because now uh, I'm going to feel bad putting him in harm's yeah. way. <laughs> he's now, his yeah. own worst enemy. <laughs> the next thing, when they finally when they finally set their wings and they start to go down, you find a place where you can you can see without spoken, spooking them. And then you watch another wave come in or another wave come in. Now you got to pinpoint where they want to be. Now, ideally, it, like usually I do this in the morning. Ideally, if you can get out again at night and because at night they could adjust in that field, they could be in that same spot or they could adjust. The night before your hunt is what you're saying. Yeah. Like yeah. You, you found them in the like morning. You could find them Wednesday. They're going Thursday, Friday, yeah. and you're hoping nobody hits it. You go get permission. Nobody's going in there before Saturday. We're coming Saturday. We got to work. We're coming Saturday. And then so you make sure you watch it. And Friday night, then yeah. you go and see if they've if you can get moved in there, over. Yeah. Friday yeah. night, find the spot because that's where they're going to land. And then you're golden. But I, I remember I had this field pinpointed and i marked the spot where they were between two trees and they were putting tile in the field and the farmer said they won't be tiling on saturday till afternoon and i said great uh we'll be in and out of there before noon on saturday morning and so the equipment friday night here's where the equipment was here where they're landing there this tree this fence line i know right where they were coming in the next morning we get up and it's so foggy you can't see a thing. We can hardly find the field. We find the field. We find the, the lane way in. And now we're driving through the field in the fog. We put near run into the tiling machine because it was so froggy. Well, where's the tree? You can't line up because you can't see the fence. You can't see the tree. We had to guess. Like, I had to guess because I was the only one that had the information. <laughs> Imagine how this is going with yeah. limited <laughs> sleep, lack of caffeine at 4 a.m. Yeah, so... <laughs> We hear the geese coming. It's getting light now. It's, it's foggy. We still can't see nothing. And all of a sudden, there they are, 20 yards over our head, 10 yards out. There they are. They're gone over our heads. You don't even get time to pull your pull your gun up. And they are actually landing 100 yards behind us. Now, they're right over our heads because they don't see us in the fog. But we were not oh. in the spot where they wanted to come down. I think we pulled about, what did we get, about six. But out of all those waves... They were landing 100 yards behind us, and it, just because the fog never lifted and we could not tell where we were set up, we couldn't even get up and move because you couldn't see in the fog. It was so thick. We, we, got, we actually stood up and got ready and pulled down about six as they come out of the fog, but it kind of it really messed up our hunt, and it was disheartening. But, yeah. but so so was, I'm, interested, I'm interested on a day like that. What, what would you want to – and I know I, I, I'm going back on this, but – from a decoy setup on a on a fresh field yeah. that you you've not hunted before, what's your strategy? All right, can I take it? You want me to take it? Yeah, go ahead. So how it goes is, Dad lately, uh, Dad is usually the guy that finds the field. He knows where they're coming in. So you get in there. Now it is key 
before you even start to think about putting out decoys is where are you going to put your layout blinds or whatever if you got those big goose chairs or whatever you're hunting in. I know there's a lot of guys don't have blinds or, or goose chairs and they'll sit on the edge of the of the, the field in a fence row or something. And I'm not talking. We've, we've done that. We went and invested now in in. We had then goose chairs and now we've, and heck at one time we were laying under burlap, but now we've invested in, in the layout blinds. And so the coffin blinds, so that that's it to me, that's the key. Cause you need to be able to get in the middle of that field. Geese typically aren't going to land that close to the woods or that close to the fence row. So you're, you're minimizing how much damage you could do versus maximizing. So it would go out, figure out where that spot is. Once you find out where dad's found out that spot is, it's the wind. And a lot of people don't know this either. And I didn't know. I, I've, I see it. So it, it, Bill, you're going to have to keep me on track and keep asking the questions. And hopefully you've yep. got them. Cause I know that you're in the same boat you've hunted uh, uh, quite a bit and you, so, it, I, but I rely on your intelligence to go, wait a minute. If I didn't hunt that much because I go right past it, because what I've had people say, well, okay, well we just set up here and we're good to go. Well, no, 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 no. It's second nature for me because dad has taught me geese land into the wind. They use the wind to slow them down and come into your decoys. So you want to face with the wind in your face, blowing or, or sorry, the wind to your back. So the geese are landing in your face. So they use that wind to stall up and come down and in. And to me, that was just, that's inherent. So I go in, okay, which way is the wind blowing? Boom. Okay. I know because the first thing you want to do is where are you going to place those blinds? Which way are you going to sit? how far apart are those blinds going to be and how are you angling? And that, because the, the biggest thing for us too, is making sure you're always shooting in a safe distance area. So how far is our shot going to fall? Are we shooting towards the road? That's pretty much a no, no, no matter where we go. And we're just not comfy with it. So it's, we've got to make the decision. Are we in the back of the pocket? So they're going to land right in our face or are we okay, on the side? Up. Yeah, see, back that's up. good. A new, uh, new hunter. What's pocket? Yeah. Perfect. So right on. So, so it, there's multiple different goose decoy setups and we've done the gambit. When we started, we didn't have that many decoys. And that's really one of the clinics that we've done. We've gone to Cabela's and put it on uh, for their waterfowl days and stuff was goose hunting on a budget. We had, we used to buy ourselves. So dad would, for my birthday, would buy me three goose shells from, from Canadian Tire, wherever the, the big Magnum shells. And then for his birthday, I'd buy him three. And then my brother-in-law, we'd buy him three. And then my brother-in-law would buy me three. And so we started to build, well, we only got 12 or so decoys and, and we just got the goose chairs versus laying under burlap with that many, that few of decoys, you can't do a pocket. So we would set them up in what we call the four family formation. So three geese to your right, three or four, depending on how many decoys you got, right? Three or four or five across from you, three or four or five to your left, and then three or four or five around you. And so you've got like a, a, four dots like picture a dice with the number four there's your decoys you pick one of those four to sit in now when you pick that because you're planning on the geese always want to land in the safest spot where is the safest spot so you're going to put about 50 yards in between each of those families so in the center you would have a 50 yard pocket that's their safe zone too tight you go 30 yards 35 yards even 40 yards that's too tight. They, they're not comfortable landing. They'll land just outside that pocket. And now you don't know if they're going to the left or the right side. You want them landing right in the middle of those four dots, those four little separate families of decoys. So now you got to figure out based on a safe shooting distance on which way you can face and the wind in your face, preferably. So you're going to sit in the decoys where the wind is coming from your back. So they land into your face. Sometimes you can't, you got to sit on the side, but in that decoy spread, typically you can sit so that the wind's from your back. So that's on the budget. Your pocket is the center. The pockets where the geese want to land. Now, once we got more, we re-roll with now what we had 180 something decoys or something. We sold off a bunch because it's just, we didn't have enough time, two hours putting out decoys and brushing in blinds. And we still didn't have decoys put out. So we, we sold off a bunch. I think we roll with what, about 135 yeah. full bodies. So now that we have so many, we typically will do a, a, a rounded V and I won't say it's a U it's a, it's a rounded V and where that pocket is, 
is where that the the hook of that V is or the U shape in there. And so with those two arms on each side, we'll extend out as far as we can, which when we got that many decoys, you can go a long ways with those arms. But what we want to do is we want to be in that circle, that U, where the V comes and those two lines meet. And so that's what we call the pocket. Now, they're not going to land right up against that. They're going to land 25, 30 yards out from that. And you got to make sure your lines are wide enough away from each other so that, because they're not going to come any closer than those two lines come in at about 35 yards. So you can get them landing about 25 yards out from you to 30 yards out from you based on those lines being wide enough. So your V being open enough. And that opens your pocket and allows them to come a little bit closer. And they're still not going to land right on top of you. And then we want to be right in that pocket, wind to our back, so they're landing into our face. So that's the pocket. That's typically our spread now. And to make them really comfy, because we have so many, we'll put those two lines out a good 60 yards with a decoy. We space them out pretty good, right? We'll put the decoys spaced out probably five yards between each decoy. You got to remember when geese start to bunch up, that means that they feel danger and they're getting ready to take off. So if you stick your decoys all close together within three feet from the air, it looks like a flock is, is tense, nervous, and uh, they won't deco- decoy into it. Yeah. So we put them the, the wider, the wider, the better. But we typically will go five yards. That's quite a bit of space. And you look and go, holy, there's a lot of space there. Absolutely. But that makes them comfy. Then they go, wow, these geese are so comfortable that they're not even that worried. They're not that bunched up. And so we'll put a good five yards. Well, with 135, 140 decoys at five yards apart, it's still way too many decoys. So yeah. we can make those lines go 60 yards plus. Now, the reason we do that, and we make them really thin. So what I do, and, and I'm going to get a little bit technical, but I think that's where this needs to go. <laughs> so, and Bill, stop me because I am going to monopolize the podcast, my man. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I'm, I, got, I got questions already, but I'm going to let you go on this little rant. Okay. We'll, uh, so I got back you up with some questions here. Awesome. I'm going to backtrack now because I've covered the on a budget and now I've, I'm going to go with, you got a, a, a quite a few or even, you don't even need that many. So to okay, do well, they're, this. They're, I'm going to stop you with this. Okay. Right, that, yep. say that if you're, if you're starting up to, uh, uh, on goose, uh, goose hunting and you maybe you're starting on your own. What, what do you, what do you need for, for a number uh, of decoys? And if I was, oh. uh, like to, to start off with, do, do you need two dozen? Is yeah. that my, enough? my first goose hunt, we were crazy successful and it, dad hadn't hunted for a long time. I don't know. I think we might've shared this story before, but I'm not sure we'll share it again. Um, but my, my very first goose hunt, I remember dad said, all right, we're going to, we're going to go goose hunting. I'm right on. So we found a goose field that they were just all day. They were piling in and we don't even find that today. But they were piling in all day. And so found them in the morning, going to get shells, go get, we don't have. And and dad had quit for a long time because I was into hockey, whatever, and, and shooting and that. And we never really hunted a whole lot. So now we're going to get back into hunting. So dad's going to, and I've not done it. So now dad wants to get back into hunting. So we're going to do it. We don't have much. He's got his old decoys from 20 plus years ago. And I don't even know if we used the decoys that day. We didn't have any goose. No, we just had duck decoys, but we didn't take any. We didn't. Yeah. So to answer your question, Bill, zero, because yeah. what we went in with, we were wearing camo. So we had dark camo. It was a, it was a plowed cornfield. We had dark camo on. Dad had burlap that we just laid under no decoys, but we knew where they were landing. And we just went and land and laid down. And, and called and they came right into where they were. We jumped up. Now they weren't as close as what we get them today with all the decoy spread, but we still knocked down a whack load. Like the, I don't, we might've had a limit. I don't remember, but we, we, we crushed them. I think the success was, success of that one was that they were actually spending the day there. Flocks would leave and then come back. They'd go get water and come back. And the farmer said, Oh yeah, they'll be there all day. You walk in, scare them out, lay down. He says in an hour they'll start coming back, and they did. They did just exactly what the farmer said. They just so all we did was just did some calling and, and shot the ones that came over us. They weren't necessarily going to even land near us, but they were so low flying over the field 
that they were low enough to shoot. We were shooting passers. We were shooting ones that actually were going to land. That was the success of that field. It was so populated. They felt so comfortable. I mean, you could have done anything. Now, is that the norm? No, no. that's not the norm. So, uh, yeah. how so many decoys be- do you need? I, you know what? We used to hunt with. We started when we started to get decoys. I think we started with twelve. I, my yeah. birthday, I got three. My brother-in-law's got three. Dad, we we both bought. Me and my brother-in-law bought dad three, and we're we were around twelve or so shells, big so, magnum shells. So, on the flip side, is there? I guess you might have just answer that question, but is there too little? Is there is there uh, a situation? And I know you said zero, but if you got uh, like some of these fields that you can't get into with a goose trailer and a truck and, and everything else, oh, we you're, know you're it. Two feet in a heart, two feet in a heartbeat, and you got your backpack and taking multiple trips to. I've done it, believe me. Mm-hmm. Taking try uh, taking uh, slinging goose uh, one armful at a time, shells or, or silhouettes out to the middle of a, a field, but there comes a point in time where, you know, maybe I'm hunting by myself and and I can only get to the middle of the field with a certain number is yeah. there a, a, a something we, in your opinion we've usually, that is too try, few? we've usually aimed for a couple of dozen like we'll make yeah. two or three trips and try and get a couple of dozen we've had fields where the farmer says there's an access road but you know, don't drive on the field well where they're landing is like 500 yards away from that access road and that's a lot of slugging and even then yeah. if it's a muddy field or if it rains walking, oh it and rains. your boots are we clogging have, up yeah we've pulled up short we, we've picked a spot where we feel we're elevated uh the geese are going to see us it's going to be visible and hopefully we with calling we can decoy them a hundred yards from where they were the night before and we've had some success but we always we've always said man if we could have just got another 100 or 150 yards further over we'd have got our limit instead of just the few flocks that we decoyed so you, the ideal spot is right where they were right where they wanted to be you'll still get some you can decoy but i know what you're saying but we've always tried to get in at least a couple dozen and that way we feel comfortable we feel that the geese are looking at the decoys instead of looking at us lumps yeah. and then uh, yeah so and and again into the wind uh, and good calling they come into the so, wind and yeah i, I don't want to uh, call in um uh, if you can go to the whole podcast on that but i, I want to ask you about brushing in your blinds oh geez yeah. okay that's, so that's my job yeah and, and okay hold on you. let go bill ahead. ask his question yeah okay go ahead. shoot so i've got i've got two questions on this one one from brushing in your blinds do you take things with you because what? if you're in a field that has nothing in it how are you brushing it? Yes, brushing we have. It? Yeah. And I've even driven, like when I find the field, that's the first thing I check out. And I'll tell you, I don't ever recommend hunting in a radish field. Uh, can you <laughs> imagine a little inch, little inch high green things of radish trying to hide behind one of well, them? We've done it. We've done it and we've got geese, but we've had to take in wheat and corn and and the, the whole thing is there, no shadows. I'll explain what I mean. And I've even checked out the field and thought, okay, it's a wheat field. Is there wheat laying around that I can load the truck up with wheat as we're driving in, stop and grab a half armful of wheat and throw it in the truck? Um, or is there a heavy layer of wheat over by the gate or somewhere where I can take that to where we're going to put the blinds down? And I've even driven out in the country the night before and gone to a field where I knew there was clever to blush in and, and spent an hour filling my truck to take the next morning so we get brushed in. Because it's, oh, not, so just, it's not just brushing. Just, okay, sorry? So you just blamed Todd earlier for his truck being dirty, but I'm starting to get a different picture of yeah, how right? Todd's truck just got dirty. Right? <laughs> no, see, here's the deal. Everybody throws all their garbage in my truck without me knowing whether we're at the gun club or hunting or in the field setting up. Coffee cups, everything's going in my truck. Dad's is too full of all the weeds and clover and crap that he's punked from every all the other <laughs> fields around so that we could brush in the blinds. Yeah. Now, I didn't mean to cut yeah. you off there, Don. That's fine. But it's not just a matter of filling every one of those little little slots, like those little cloth loops with enough wheat or corn or whatever to cover it in. And when you close the doors, making sure that that you're covered up, your head's covered up, and you're looking through those leaves, and your head isn't out in the open. It isn't just a matter of that. We found that we really, really increased our success if you take that wheat and corn and then start to layer it and pile it up on each side of the blind and around the blind so that it is a gradual slope. And you can even buy blinds now that are called uh, 
No, I want to no shadow, shadow blinds. They're yeah. called shadow no, blinds. No shadows. They're, yeah. they're, what they are is about two and a half feet wider than a normal blind because you don't use that when you're in them. It's just that it's like a tent comes up to they where taper. you are on an angle. They taper. Because if it was, if you're laying in a square box and no sides come up to you to the height you are laying on and go across the top, that, ca that casts a shadow. And from the sky... They'll see those shadows, or that, like, and lots of times you, you want them to come at you. Hopefully, they're coming into the sun too to blind them. But lots of times the wind's blowing where they're you're in the sun, you're looking at the sun, and so they would see that dark end of your blind or the dark side of your blind. So and it looked big, dark, and ominous and based on what they're used to seeing. Oh, it's astronomical how many trips I carry of armful of wheat and just drop it beside every blind and then taper it down so that from the sky, there's no shadow. It's just, it looks flat because yeah. I put so much wheat together between the blinds. So you can tell that is the, they call me the decoy whisperer because I get irritated and I end up putting the decoys out myself. But it's because on the opposite side, they're the brushian whisperer. Like dad is super anal about nonstop brushing in your blind. So when he's saying the coffin blinds, they all have loops all the way around these layout blinds on the ground that you can stuff corn stalks or whatever, and it will hold them because they're elastic, bland, uh, elastic bands all the way, looped all the way around. We don't just use those. Dad now has to have enough stuff so that it comes and you use those but then he tapers it and piles it up so it's tapered all the way down. And it's almost like from blind to blind, you have a mat that is just nothing but whatever the crop is or whatever, like if it's corn stalks or it's, it's wheat or it's clover, it's tapered all the way down and then up into the next blind that's right beside you. And we'll typically put about three, four feet between us. Sometimes we'll get right close. Other times we'll have five or six yards. It just depends on the coverage, how many decoys we're going to put out, how wide we're going to make that pocket on how much room we got between us. But regardless, there won't be a shadow. Dad will have it so that there's so much that it goes and tapers down from the blind to the ground. And the next blind, it starts and goes up to that blind. So it's just like a mat of, of, of crop or, or weeds or clover or whatever we're putting down there. So yeah, brush and brush. And when you think you've brushed enough, brush 10 times more. No kidding. Yeah, maybe that's, yeah, I, I've never brushed in my blind. And that's not to say that uh, I haven't had success. I have, but maybe my success would be better and I'd have uh, less weary birds wanting to come into the decoy setup and they would commit without hesitation if they're feeling a little bit more oh i tell you what we do yeah like we don't hunt unless those blinds are brushed in now and there's been times when i've said like let's brush it in the night before that takes forever or once we hunt a, a wheat field with a lot of like some 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 wheat stubble laying around that you can really grab we'll leave them we'll put them away and hopefully we'll be able to keep the majority of that those the the wheat stuffed in the wheat stalks and that stuffed in or a corn stalk stuffed in those hoops. Yeah. So the next time it's a little less work, but it falls out and everything else. And then the trailer's a mess regardless, but it dries up and it gets brittle. But for the most part, whatever stays, it's good to go because it doesn't matter if it's dried out and brittle, it's the color you want. And it's, and it's a uh, camouflage. And yeah. I don't know, we got seven layout, I think blinds. I think there's four right now in the trailer. We always have with us. But there's three hanging in my shed, and they all have corn and wheat in them right now. And once a week, I just go, I have to go in and sweep underneath them because it just continually falls on to off. But whatever's left on them, it's what you don't have to pick up when you go back. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that's, well, that's, the, that's, that that's is, a good tip, tip for us, for me this year, too. I mean, I got two final approach uh, coffin blinds. Mm -hmm. Um bought them many, many years ago and one I broke my heart. I, I just cleaned up my garden shed and, and the mouse mice made it uh, a nest. So uh, they did a number on it, which is gonna need some repair this weekend coming up. But it got me thinking about the uh the carrying that how you know, if the farmer has just done the wheat field and they bailed all the the, the windrows of, of straw, <laughs> there's nothing left to brush those blinds in with. I got to start thinking about how 
we're going to make that happen. Yeah. There, quite often there still is a lot left. Like we'll find, you'll find every now and then or a, the odd row that'll have a bunch where they didn't get it all. But, but yeah, it's, dad'll go and collect a bunch of crap from here, there or everywhere. And yeah. but even if there's not enough of the crop, I've gone to the fence rows or the edge of the woods and I've cut weeds because lots of fields they're used to seeing lots of fields with uh, green uh, grass and, and, and tufts of, of green stuff growing up in the fields. And I've pulled them out by the roots and stood them around us like they're still in the ground to give well, them to, to go out the shadow. And yeah, I've made countless trips uh, from the blinds to the edge of the field to cut the grass or pull out clumps of these green weeds and just keep carting them. And the more you do it, you think, oh my gosh, I need more yet. And these so, guys are still out putting out decoys, and Todd's still moving stuff and still arguing with me. <laughs> yeah, we still haven't kids to finish that conversation. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah, no, but I just want to. So the the brushing of the blind is not as important to make it match the terrain as it is to break up the shadows of the edges. You got it. You got Ooh, it. Because that radish field, we did, we did not have any radish cover. We we did. We went to the edge of the field and, and the fence rows in the woods and whatever we could grab, green grass, uh, whatever, ragweed, whatever we could get, we were clumps of what looked like a, an island of weeds in the middle of that radish field. And they decoyed great to our decoy. No shadow. And, I, and because of no shadows, I, I was shocked. Yeah, because no I shadow. thought, oh my gosh, are they really like they've been feeding in there? They've been eating the tops off these radishes. Are they really going to believe that there's an island of weeds where they've been feeding? And they did. Yeah, no shadows. <laughs> okay, well, I learned some. <laughs> yeah, no, that is when when we started doing the the no shadow deal, it really improved. It really did. It picked them up. It it they brought they 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 started dropping in a lot easier for sure. No no two pass looks or anything like that. But okay, yep. Yeah. Back, back to your decoys. Okay, the Mister Whisperer. Well, and where were we? So, so yeah. So, well, I we we'll get in the field. We find the spot, right? So, the wind you want to your back because you you want it going into their face if you can. So now, if you're rolling with just even twenty four decoys, you get into even even forty decoys like that. You can do the V setup. I mean, we. We predominantly, when we first started hunting with that few of decoys, we were doing the four family setup. And every now and then, here's a here's a little little tip and, and trick that we learned is a lot of people are doing the regular V, like he, uh, almost everybody. So we flip it up every now and then after the first couple weeks of of uh, early season, and then we'll flip it back and we'll go back to our old school roots of the four family setup with just a bunch more decoys. So we'll put 12 in one, 12 in another, 12 in another, and the 12 in the one we're going to sit in with that square. And then in the middle is where they're going to drop 50 yards in the middle. And we'll, we'll crush them that way because they just get used to seeing all these decoys in a big V issue, UEV and getting shot at. And now all of a sudden, Whoa, wait a minute. Those are four separate families. And now I've often said to dad year after year, early season, we should always just do the four family setup, no matter how many decoys we use, because they're in families in the early season. They're not flocked up. You don't have the migrators coming down and you're just getting local birds, which there's a lot of local birds around, but they're still staying in their little families. And so when they see the four families, then it makes them a, maybe make them a little comfier. They're going to see one huge, big 130 flock you they're going to be like, wait a minute, where'd all that come from? And, and this is where I say, people say I'm a little bit whacked out because I, I, I give a little too much credit to the goose, but I say, and this is where I, I stopped myself previously, but in the clinics and that, that we do, I always say, I think like a goose. So while dad and everybody's brushing in the blinds, I'm out there and I'll, we'll have the, the layout. I start with what we're going to do. So I'll say, okay, if we're going to do the U, figure out which way the wind's going to blow, then what's the safe direction? There's a barn there. We can't shoot that way. So maybe we can't be back in the end pocket. Maybe we got to be on one arm of that U. So we're shooting sideways at them coming in, which I like better, to be honest with you, because I love shooting them sideways when they're coming by you like a skeet target. But yeah. so we'll we'll figure out where we're going to sit and we position those those blinds first. They're the very first thing because that's what you're building your spread around. That is the key point. 
right? Just out of curiosity, do you got right hand and left handed shooters in your no. set? And we got only right handers. All right hands. All right handers. All right. Well, I guess I can't hunt with you. I'm a left handed shot. <laughs> you wouldn't. You wouldn't know how to set it up then. It'd yeah. Well, no. Set. It's it's okay because we'd we'd get the ones you miss. It so doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> it shoot. doesn't matter what hand you shoot off. <laughs> it they always shoot the goose I'm going for anyway. Oh, so come now. Yeah. Oh, I got no, stories no, upon I get, stories. I get up and I get on a goose. It falls. I move to another goose. It falls. I move to another goose. I just now I just automatically go to the go to the outside of the flock or look for the one going away. Because yeah. He's just I getting just slower wait. and slower every year. By the time now he gets up, we're out of shells. So any goose still flying ain't coming down. <laughs> so <laughs> he makes sure he loads up with heavy shot or bismuth, and then he's all right. But one of the best hunts Todd and I ever had, we could not face the wind because we would have been shooting right at the farmer's house, his, his buildings and his, his garage, his vehicles. And so, and we, now, but justify that that we're still 400 yards out. We still don't take that chance. We yeah, still don't want course, shot falling down. Like we were just, but we not. were in his front yard. Like with the, there was a road, his house and the field was between and it was a wheat field. So we did a J and we made the big long. Oh, now you're stealing. My, I wasn't going to the J yet. Oh, well, I didn't anyway. get there yet, but Hey, well, spoiler well, alert. Well, <laughs> I, it, it triggered me when, when he said he liked shooting them sideways. And that is a really good way to shoot because they're fo- so focused on that handful of geese in the in the curve of the J as they come down that line of geese, like the leg of the J, and they're aiming for that spot to land right in front of that nice full curve of the J, that nice pocket at the end of it. They're they're coming lower and lower right down that line, and we're about maybe 30, 40 yards up from that pocket, and now they're only 10, 15 yards in the air flying completely sideways to us. Yeah. So and they're not even so paying attention to us. We can sit up and they don't even flare. They don't move. They don't even flare. No. You just start swinging on them and drop them. So dad's stealing my thunder right yeah. now because I was saving the best for last. Well, anyway, that hunt, and I'm sorry, Todd, but that hunt, it came to my mind. That, we limited out in an hour and that was one of the best hunts we ever Oh, we've had. done better, but that was a good hunt. So, yeah. and that's, that's the secret weapon is that J hook. So I'll get there, but the, let me so, finish the V first, the, the U. Uh, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to ask you in your, your V U or J, whatever it is. And I'm going to say this tongue in cheek, just to fire you up. Yeah. Bring you're, it. Just, you're just dropping the decoys down and, and not paying much attention. To the <laughs> and all stuff. Okay. I'm glad. Yeah. Right. So this is why they call me and the I, wacko. I say that uh, completely tongue in cheek yeah, just to get you going. The, there's many things in this life that I am very flipping about and don't care like my laundry laying in front of the dryer and I just throw it in to wear it and so it's nice and warm and and you gotta fold it and put it away we I am the opposite of the I am you when the laundry machine is done I on decoys so I'm super anal OCD and I don't know I, I it drives me nuts so and that's why th- I they typically Scotty will help me put start the spread and then he quits and goes and helps dad after we get yeah, going. Yeah, because he doesn't want to get yelled at. I don't even help him. I don't even start. I just go right to brush it in the blind. It just, I don't get how you He'll can't say, see it. What do you think of that, dad? I don't even look up. Looks good to me, Todd. I just keep brushing. <laughs> Which irritates me even it more. It doesn't matter what I say. It won't be right anyway. So, so yeah. So, as we're putting these out, we've de- we've now identified, okay, we're going to be on the arm of this U or V, or are we going to be on the end pocket? And once you put the blinds out, now I'll start with the front line on each side and figure out how far out I got to go. Now, my theory on how far out I go is crucial in my head. Other people say I'm nuts, right? So everything I do on this now going forward, a lot of people are like, we just throw them out, we kill geese. Okay, great. I am not, I want to every single freaking time, I want to maximize my opportunity and my odds. So I go super OCD and it does drive me nuts until it's light and I hear honks and then I got to jump in my blind. So I will put out the first lines and make that, V or the U, the rounded V, and I will do it in front of our blinds. And now sometimes I'll be, have our blinds right on the front. And if it's early season, most likely right up on the front. And so that they're, we're, we're getting as close as possible and they're not as wary as it goes on. I'll put us two decoys back in, into the pocket so that there's a two decoy sets before they see the blinds. And, and in case there's movement or there, cause they're a little more weary. And so I'll make that V or that U or the four families. I will set out and, and set my pocket so that I know where that's going to be. I know I visualize I'm a goose. I'm coming down the line. 
So how far out do I make my lines? Well, here's the wind and I don't want them getting out behind us. I don't want them out too far left, too far right. And I will say with the family method where you set up those four, like on a dice, that there is tendency for those decoy, for those geese to not land in the center. If you make that pocket too tight. So it, there'll be times that I'll even over caution and make it 60 yard pocket in the center because they will land on the outsides of those because it's just almost as safe as landing in the center is landing on the edges on the outsides of those. And now they're out of range because you've got 60 yards and then they land on the outside and they're now 80 yards when they're coming down and you're doing nothing but stand sitting there staring at geese on the ground, staring at you. And that sucks. So that's yeah, the one there. downfall. That yeah. That's the one caveat and pitfall of the four family. But I will say that if you make that center pocket wide enough, it can be, you can have the best hunt ever because they got nowhere to go. They commit to that center and it's on. But so the U will typically do a U or a V and then we'll put the lines out. How far out? I usually run them around 60 yards because I don't want them coming in and coming into the wind and being able to skirt outside and around the edge because they will land. And so I will make that also thin. The, when I get to the 60 to the 50 yard, 55, 60 yard decoys, because every five yards, I'm going to space them out there, but they're going to be a single. There's not going to be one beside it because they want safety in numbers. And so if I've got those lines really skinny, but a big a mass amount in the pocket, they're going to be more eh, eh, coaxed to land into the majority of the geese because that's the safety zone versus the stragglers way out on the line. And... Those stragglers, I make sentinels so that they're meaning their heads are the up. They're not feeder geese decoys. They're full-blown big bull sentinels with their heads up because those are the ones that always watch for danger. So if I'm in a goose pack family flock, I'm going to have my sentinels on the edge watching for the coyotes or whatever could come for danger. And therefore, they're not going to want to land right with those sentinels because the head up may mean that that sentinel seen something too. And so wow. I get them out there 60 yards and I make them thin and I might even make it instead of every five yards, I'll start spacing those out seven, eight yards away from the next decoy on that skinny line on each one, just so that they don't want to land way out there on those ends. You want them in the pocket. So then I'll come in three or four decoys down that line on each side. And then I start filling it out. So now I'll add a, I'll add a decoy just on the outside. So I, and start the, and initial, you got her. Your initial you uh, from that, you'll start to go out five yards. Put another decoy and now I'm going to so make it into a raindrop. Out. Right. OK, so yeah. the, all the way back and then where we're where our blinds are, I'm going to take that because we have so many decoys and we never used to do this. But because we have so many, I'm going to we end up taking that. It'll go for 70 yards behind us. Every five yards, you put a decoy. And again, that space is big time. I mean, you're looking at it going, wow, there's a lot of space here. The bigger the space, the better. Because if they want to land in that pocket, they're going to be comfy with that big space. Heck, they might feel comfy enough to come land right beside you if you've got enough space between the decoys. And they've done that. And absolutely. And that's really when we realize that, holy crap, you can't make these spaces too big. I mean, like 30 yards between decoys is ridiculous. But I mean, if you go five, seven yards uh, up between each decoy, A, with 135, do the math on that. You've got some real estate covered. And so, but the pocket is where they want to land, where there's no yeah, decoys think, coming in. And you make it as wide back as you can in a, in a teardrop, in a raindrop shape. So way behind you, it goes for 50, 60 yards. They're not going to land behind you. They're not going to go over you. They're going to drop right in front of you or right around you. And that's the key. Yeah. And I think I've just picked up on something that I do incorrectly based on this conversation here. And this is great because I'm learning stuff too, right? It's, it's, I make my, my decoys, um, too close together. Like I, I don't, um, I don't have a ton of decoys to go with and I try to maximize what I can, but I still think based on this conversation here that I could go wider between the decoys and the individual sets or families and give it the illusion of, of, of comfort. Oh, it's I don't for, think you can go too long. wide, like with, within, with, with common sense. You can't, yeah. you, I mean, if you had eight yards between decoys, you're not too, too, especially too. if it's just a family in the field, if they bunch up, they see, they sense danger. They're ready to leave. 
Yeah. And so that's what it looks like from the air. Oh, don't go down there. That something's making that family nervous. They're getting ready to leave. Yep. Yep. Space. So that's pretty much the V and, and the four family setup. But now everybody's heard the the J hook that that is the that's our secret sauce. And we don't use it as much as we should because it's difficult to set up. There's a lot of what I, I and that maybe this is my analness being the the decoy whisperer. So the, let me let me finish off too. It, when I make those lines out on the on the front edge of the pocket, right? So the ones that the the, de- the geese are going to land against those two lines. They're the front lines that I've built out. I will take one or two decoys on each side of that line and bring it out into the pocket a little bit. Weird. So it's like not in line. And the reason I do that is because I don't want the geese looking at the blinds. I want the geese looking at this so they see this formation. And I will say we have avian acts and, and big feet and stuff. So the ones that will move a bit, I always position them facing us, but I always take the big feet too. And I will make sure they're aiming towards our blinds. All decoys are aiming the same way towards our blinds. And it's almost, I don't know if that matters because I've not done it another way. But to me, if I stand back and look at that pocket, I'm looking right. It's almost like a landing strip and telling me land here. They're not all oblong facing the wrong way or anything. They're all facing the the same direction. Like they're all feeding in one way. And to me that it, it, it just looks better, but then I'll go and I'll grab one on each side and I'll pull it into the pocket a little bit just to be that one goose. That's out of shape, kind of weird. So that those decoys come in or those geese coming in when they're coming into land, they've got this big pocket, but they can't really land right there. They're going to be watching that one decoy because they've got to make sure they stay away from it enough. So my pocket's wide enough, but that one decoy way back 40 yards out from our blind, almost like in between the, from, from our blinds to the 60 yard line, one of those at 40 yards from our blinds is sticking out. Their eyes are on that decoy when they're coming in, not on our blinds because they're, they're looking at it going, okay, the pocket's just after that. I got to clear it. And that's my thought process. I'm thinking so what, like what a position goose. You put the, the decoys in that are behind you then. Well, typically the ones right around us, I, we will, we will tend to mix up face in every which way. And then as we go back further, always they face our blind only because if flocks come from behind us, They've got to circle around and come around in, and I don't want them coming behind us and, and then using the wind and landing behind that spread. Cause there's, there's 60 yards of decoys there. We're, we're not going to get a shot at them. All right. No, that's it. So I don't so want that, them coming behind us, swooping around, using the wind and coming down. If they're facing our blind too, it's almost like, Oh, I got to keep going over these guys to get to that pocket. It's like there are arrows pointing to where I want yeah. them to go. So your, your decoys, whether they're in front, beside, or behind, are all basically centralized around your... Facing your, our blinds. Where, where, you're, where you're just sitting. Yep. Yep. Hmm. Yep. I, I shouldn't say our blinds. The pocket. Because oh, if, the we're pocket. On the, if we're on the arm, I don't face them to our blinds. I face them to the pocket. Right? I'm, I'm using those almost like picture them like arrows. The beaks of the decoys are the arrows pointing them where to go. Yep. That makes sense to me. Right. So that's, and I don't know, like I said, people go like, really, Todd? Like, come on, they're not human. They're not thinking that way. But hey, we're all animals. We all got subconscious. You're telling me that I can't maybe persuade the subconscious of that lead goose coming in that, hey, they're all facing that way. I need to keep going that way. Yeah. I like to think I can. In in the middle of all this too, I just want to jump in here communication and it's getting more difficult for me year after year because I invariably mess up. I wear hearing aids, can't turn them up loud enough. And those geese are making so much noise when they're coming in that you can talk to one another in the blinds, but I can't hear. Not Scott. to the volume. He talks yeah. to us. <laughs> not the not to the volume. That I, I get hear. mad. That's the problem. And I can hear Todd and Scott talking and I'm saying, Okay, the, like all I can hear is this cackle. Where are they, guys? Where are they? Where are they? Just shut up, Dad. I'll tell you when to sit up. Yeah, and, and <laughs> but I need to know what direction. At least no, I you want don't. To know you what just direction. need to know to sit up. They keep. They keep. <laughs> It'll be the, right there. Yeah, <laughs> they keep me in the dark. But I'll say yeah, which yeah. side? Which side? What you know? What side am I going to get up on? And uh, I can't hear what they're saying. And then one of them might say that I'll miss. 
bigger flock behind us lower. Let oh, this flock yeah. go over. Bigger Nothing irritates me lower. more Let than this. Let this flock go over. And I won't hear that. And I think, oh, they're saying, oh, here's ready, three. I'll jump ready. up. There goes 40. Yeah. Well, I was just going to ask that question. Based on, based on what you guys have done, do you tend to let the first flock decoy and land it depends to, on the situation yeah like if yeah, there's three I, or four and there's 20 coming right in behind them let them land let them land yeah that's i was just gonna say i've done both uh, you know if yeah. the sky is empty behind it and there's nothing there it don't let them land uh, you're taking what you can get but if there's a flock upon like uh, <laughs> wave upon wave of birds coming in i may let the first uh first set of birds land yeah and well, then the second set come in and we'll when there's enough those. for us to to get three yeah. each then it's go time yeah. yeah but so this year i'm going to try something different I, oh geez i bought this microphone that that my wife wears around her neck if we're in the car and a broadcast right to oh, my hearing aid. bluetooth you said, you and, said megaphone yeah <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah right but, hey geese we're over here <laughs> and when i showed it to todd he says you're kidding me i said no he's I went down the bedroom and I said, you talk to me. And I told him everything he said. Well, why didn't you bring that goose up? He's had it for years. <laughs> I, I, like, how it. stupid. Now, I'm not I'm not going to remind him either. When he gets Yak and the Scott in, the, in there, I'm going to hear everything he says because it broadcasts right to my ears. I would never say anything. I wouldn't so say to your face or I haven't hear, already. I'm going to hear everything he says, <laughs> but I'm going to make sure when he says take him, I hear it. You're going to be deaf. Well, I was going to say, I hope it has no noise cancellation on it because you'll you'll wear it for the first shot. I'll get, I'll get, sh- yeah, right. I pull the trigger with that thing around my neck. He's going to know it. I don't have to worry about that. Three but. in, three and a half inches of hello. No, that's <laughs> my hearing aids are are like mini computers, and they shut down and. And uh, they block out sudden noises. Now, you can't come up behind me and clang the dishes. Like our fire alarm in the kitchen went off three times this week. Don't ask me why. Yeah, right. And I, I looked up and I thought, what the hell is that? And my wife jumped out of her skin. Can you not hear that? Oh, yeah, that's the fire alarm. But my hearing aid <laughs> shut down because of the shrillness right off the bat. Yeah, he says my voice oh, is that way. Oh, I shut it down. But, yeah, so anyway, but that is... All right. That, that that's I, that's the V, that's the family, and the secret sauce is our J hook. I think we we touched on some. I think I don't want to go too deep more, too much deeper on the podcast. It's a good spot to kind of wrap it up. I agree with you. Week, we'll guess, leave but, the J hook for another day because it is the secret sauce. But 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 that's the the hook. We don't use it all the time. It absolutely J hook. We don't use it all the time, and a lot of guys will use it to death and then can't figure out why it doesn't work. And there is a certain time and place to use it and yeah, so I so many more questions on that kind of uh, stuff because, absolutely because the, way I, the way i think about it is like the, the the fishing lure that worked this year that didn't work next year but yeah but yeah so next podcast we'll get into the j-hook and the secret sauce of that because if you can use it i got a story and a half best best hunt we've ever ever had using that j-hook and so we use it when we can but it there's a time and a place and it doesn't yeah. always work I'm anxious to hear that kind of uh, those stories and learn from your experience. That's awesome. I hope uh, listeners learn something today. That's that's fantastic. Yeah, I hope so too. I love talking. And then we got we got all kinds of stories. So that, I can't wait till we get into story time because there's nothing like a goose hunting story. It ain't like deer where you got to sit there and be quiet and your fun's done on texting. I mean, we were having a blast. And so we got stories upon stories upon stories. And we'll see if we get Scotty on and he can tell about how he steals all the bands from us too. But. <laughs> and that'll do it for this week, folks, for the Redneck Country Podcast. I'm Bill, the Almost Guy Tom. And I'm Todd. And thanks for listening. And folks, if you want to be part of the podcast or you want to give us some feedback or really contact us about anything, feel free to email us at podcast at the redneckcountry.com. Again, that's podcast at the redneckcountry.com. Thanks for listening. Talk to you again next week.